Rafael Rowe. Rafael Rowe, that's me. Welcome to Shoreditch. Thank you. Um, presenter of Inside the World's Toughest Prisons. Uh, you've been to prison, haven't you? I have. I spent 12 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Yeah. How was that? That's an easy question, isn't it? Is that? <laughs> it was horrible. It was torturous. It was dangerous. Obviously. It was everything you can imagine, yeah. you know, in your worst nightmare of going to prison. I mean, there's one thing going to prison for a crime you committed and so you yeah. adapt and you conform yeah it's a completely different ball game when you're talking about going in prison for a crime you didn't commit and to yeah. boot for murder and a series of robberies so you're not only a prisoner but you're deemed a very dangerous prisoner and being put through the newspapers as that um your show's on netflix and there seems to be like a i mean crime is like netflix it's just everywhere isn't it like all my sisters or five sisters they all love crime stuff i don't know what it is about is it about women that just love crime stuff like they all watch your show they all tell me to watch it i'm, I'm not i'm not i don't I, i'm more of a um i don't know I, I like movies but like in the last year on netflix i just seem to watch crime thrillers like uh serial killer stuff it seems like a to be a massive trend it has been for a very long time i think it's the unreachable isn't it i mean i think people are attracted to crime because it's not in their comfort zone it's not in their yeah. world it's something they can peep into but they'd be scared to be involved themselves and maybe yeah. that's one thing but i think it's a fascination with people who just don't conform to the rules you know whether it's a criminal committing crime yeah. somebody who's committed serious offenses or, or the fascination with someone like a serial killer you know how do you go about doing that kind of stuff i mean it's terrifying yeah i think it comes down to the fact and yeah you're right women in particular, yeah. are attracted to crime, um, criminality, punishment, whatever it is. And I don't know what it is. I don't think it's a turn me on kind of thing. I think it's it's a morbid fascination with a world that they don't familiarize themselves with very often. Yeah. Or they're like planning to kill their husbands and looking for... That could be the subplot. <laughs> that could, they want to know how to get away with murder. That's no, that is, that's an actual show, isn't it, on it Netflix? It is. I've watched it. How, it's really good. Is it really good? It is really good, actually. No, I recommend it, how to get away with murder. It gets a bit bizarre later on You weren't a writer on that show, by any chance. I, I wasn't. I wish I was, though. <laughs> it, it, it is a really good show, actually. It starts off very subtle, um, yeah. and then it gets, like most shows, you know, as they make show yeah. after show you kind of reach a natural end and then they kind of drag it out. So, yeah. But yeah, making a murderer. So maybe that's the plot, the subplot. Women Your are out sisters there. are planning to kill you, John. And not me. I'm not married to them, obviously. That'd be weird. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so I've obviously been watching your show um, and it, it, the, it was the one in, I think it was the one in Paraguay. It was one of your last ones. Because um, obviously my angle on the podcast is business, you know, to learn as much as I can, implement it into like my businesses and, um everything that i know what i was fa the most fascinating thing for me straight off the bat was um prisons have their own like economies um and you, you know you, you go from like the people that have like more money that i mean weirdly you think like i would think cause i've never been in prison i would think that you know everyone's treated equally they just you know serve their time but in these mad places that you go to there's literally jobs and there's a hierarchy and there's like a economy inside of them um how does that make any sense? Surely these prisons shouldn't be like that. It's, it's different. You, you know what? It's about the country and it's about the culture. So here in the UK, for example, yeah. um, let's start with prison officers are paid a decent wage. I mean, they okay. complain that they're not. But to start with... How much are they paid? Uh, 30,000 probably. Okay. That's probably 25 basic. And then it goes up to 30, 35, yeah. around that kind of figure. Okay. But, the, but the point is, is that they earn a decent wage. Therefore, they're harder to corrupt. So that's right. the first thing. So therefore, contraband doesn't get into prisons in the same way it would in somewhere like South America. Yeah. Um, and there's always been a black market in British prisons. Right. You, you, you know, whether it's a, a cigarette or tobacco, I will or give phones. you... No. Or, or phone, phones yeah. are the commodity now. I mean, they're yeah. worth hundreds and hundreds of pounds in prison, you, right. you, you know, as are drugs. You, you know, something you'd pay a tenner for on the outside would probably cost you 50 quid on the inside because yeah. it's harder to get hold of. Although okay. they do say prisons are flooded with drugs. But you talk about Paraguay. Yeah, these kind of ecosystems inside these sorts of countries are driven by the lack of resources provided by the government. So right. prisoners have to be entrepreneurs, you know, the way... 
they make money to either supply their drug habit or just to survive yeah. in prison. Yeah. That's what they yeah. do. And Paraguay, I've never seen anything like it. They have these little sections in the prison and they had what they called the market, which you're referring to, where people set up their own little shops. Yeah. Family supplies them with products and they sell them to other prisoners. Not all prisons um, or prisoners in prisons have access to money. Like yeah. British prisons, it's all done by paper. You have an account kept somewhere and you can order stuff in yeah. somewhere like paraguay's prison the prisoners do have physical money so they can trade daily no way that's mm. right yeah i remember the guy that was going through the rubbish and he was um picking bits out to sell back to people and it, it was uh, i just couldn't believe that was going on in a prison it, it, it was amazing esteban was his name and yeah. and i bumped into him when i was i was watching this moment this bizarre moment where this truck came into the prison to yeah. pick up the daily rubbish and once they gathered all the rubbish in these carts they yeah. then tip them out into a space in the tinlado which is where a lot of these you yeah. know impoverished prisoners live and then prisoners would gather around and go through all this garbage yeah. you know scavenge through it and and i approached esteban and said what the hell are you doing and he said it's looking for food and i'm yeah. thinking you poor thing you have nothing to eat and he said no it's not for eating it's for selling and i'm yeah. thinking how can you sell the shit that you're scavenging through and then he started to gather up any kind of plastic bottle yeah. that he could pick up yeah and that kind of ended our conversation it was like it was for him something that he could and i thought poor guy's going to take it back and then about an hour or two later i'm helping serve the food and i see him selling the bottles and the bread that he got from so everything has a value even everything the rubbish i yeah. mean uh, you, you know he's a mini entrepreneur and he literally is use. like yeah he's got amazing. a business it was amazing you know he cut the bottles so he gathered these bottles not to collect water or drinks yeah. but he then yeah. cut the bottles and he was giving them or selling them to prisoners which they were using as plates so even down yeah. to the plastic bottles yeah. he saw as a commodity they and they put their food in weren't they like the noodles and stuff put the noodles into yeah. these and bottles i mean because the prison don't have the resources um and that was at the very bottom of the scale you know i yeah, met another course. guy who you know started his own laundry started yeah. his own sort of restaurant in the prison and the prison authorities give him the authority to to do that and he told me he was earning more money doing that than he was outside. on the outside smuggling drugs that's mental that is uh, I, 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 no doubt there's a commission going to the offices probably yeah, or I free, mean, free washing or whatever. Free washing, but it's more than that. I think a lot of the prisoners in Paraguay, they actually pay for their sleeping space, you know. So yeah. you have guys sleeping outside in the Tinlado, which was an open, you know, corrugated space. And then yeah. you had guys um, who had inside space, but they had to pay for that, you know. So a lot yeah. of them, like the tattoo guy that I met, you know, you earn a living tattooing other prisoners. You, now, that in most prisons is contraband. You're not allowed yeah. those kind of tattoo guns. But he had the whole shebang and was yeah. providing tattoos to prisoners, getting paid. So he was running his own little business. It's crazy. Do, do you know, it actually reminds me, <laughs> funnily, the tattooing thing <laughs> is when I lived in Hawaii and I was like, you know, surf bum, whatever. I lived in a hostel and they used to call it um, the backpacker salon. And I used to cut people's hair for food. Like literally, if I cut guys' hair, they would make me pasta. <laughs> and I was like, and they used to, we used to sit on the chair, put this towel around them. And I used to cut their hair terribly, I might add, <laughs> um, for like five quids of a pasta. You've come a long way. I have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm grafted. Um, um, but I mean, it's those are the funny moments. And I was saying earlier before we, we started this is that um, the bunk beds that are in some of these um, prisons are just like hostels when you travel, um, except you pay $15 a night. Um, well, these guys probably pay more, especially <laughs> in places like Paraguay, you know. you know. I mean, there is, of course, there's a, a, a similarity to where you stayed in this hostel. Do you know what? If I would have accidentally ended up in Paraguay at the prison, I would have thought it was just a hostel. Yeah, you say that. <laughs> you say that, but you would need a knife, you know, not yeah. the scissors to cut hairs. You'd need a knife to sleep with, you know. Is that I'd, dangerous? I'd have been like, where's reception? Like, what's the <laughs> Wi Fi code? <laughs> it's a lot worse than you saw, John, that's for sure. I can imagine. Yeah. Can and imagine. it's a lot more dangerous. You know, yeah. you can't underestimate how, how dangerous. I mean, in that place, yeah. people were losing their lives on a regular yeah, yeah, yeah. basis. And yeah. at your hostel, you could make the decision to leave any time you wanted. These guys yeah, true. can't. You know, some of them deserve to be in there for a very long time because of the nature yeah. of their crimes. But most of them are just down and out to, yeah. you know, they need therapy rather yeah. than punishment yeah i don't want any hostel that i've ever stayed at that like still follows me on instagram to judge what I'm, uh, they're not that bad they're not that bad they probably um, are actually <laughs> you describe it they are um yeah no so what one question i really want to ask you is 
what's the worst thing you've seen in in one of these prisons like the worst thing that you've seen or heard about i think the worst thing um, and there's a number of different kind of um, context is here but I think when I was in Brazil which was the first prison that I went to in Porto uh, Velo um, up in the north Rodinia it, it is a place in the Amazon and um, there are two different gang factions there the PCC and the Red Command and so they're at war not just in prison but outside of prison over drugs have been for a very long time these gangs were created inside the prisons um, who controls the drugs kind yeah. of thing and I think the worst thing was that these gangs, when they get into fights and riots, they cut off each other's heads. And so I was meeting prisoners who had, you know, decapitated other prisoners and had played football with their heads. And for me, it was barbaric. And it was just when you stand there and you watch that and you see that, and I have, and anybody can if they go on the internet, it's just horrifying to see, you know, young men kicking the heads that they've cut off of other young men and laughing and joking about it um it was just something you know you don't want anybody to experience because you know those boys with their heads cut off have yeah. mothers sisters brothers of relatives and it was just for me when you ask the question that was probably the worst thing that that i've seen um and watched during this series so you saw that actual actually happen? Or no, you I, saw a video. I saw videos <laughs> of what the and guys. And you went to where it was. Yeah. So two weeks before I went to the prison, the, it, the prison broke out into a riot, and and the two factions got at each other, and they were stabbing each other, killing each other. You know, you, lots of prisoners lost their lives. So when you planned to go over there, that hadn't happened yet, I assume, because you would have planned way before two weeks. Yeah. So that happened during when you and you still went, and it wasn't the first time. You know, really? the, the, the prisons in Brazil are known for sort of outbreaks of riots because these places are run by prisoners. You know, the prison guards themselves, they don't come within 10 feet of prisoners. And when they do, they're armed with, with you know, shotguns and yeah, rifles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so they keep a distance from every prisoner. So during the day, they unlock them and then they back off and they leave the prisoners to their own devices. Yeah. And what happens occasionally is the prisoners break into these faction riots because there's two separate gangs basically. two separate gangs predominant and they used to mix together and there was a harmony to some extent but now they're all very much divided and all they want to do is kill each other so yeah weeks before i went to this particular prison a riot had broken out and prisoners had been burnt to death in their cells some prisoners you, you know I'm, talk, I'm not talking about one or two prisoners i'm talking about tens of prisoners yeah, yeah, yeah. had been decapitated and so i saw the prisoners kicking the heads. I saw the bodies headless um, piled up high oh, after yes. the guards because what happens is when these things happen, the guards retreat. They leave the prison. They leave the prisoners to it. And so the prisoners commit these horrendous crimes. When I went to the prison two weeks after, I met some of those prisoners who were involved in the decapitating of other prisoners' heads. You interviewed them? Witnessed um, the murder of other prisoners. You know, one guy I spoke to was in a cell as close as you are to me. Prisoners in a cell opposite him. Seven of them were killed in that cell when they were burnt to death. The, the cell door was locked, fire was set, and they couldn't get out, and they died. And so I'm standing talking to these individuals, and you kind of, you kind of look in their eyes and you try to imagine what these individuals have witnessed or have taken part in, and it, yeah. it really does chill you to the bone. That's insane. Do you know, I, I feel like watching your show, <clears throat> the theme, the theme is drugs. Like, the, it seems like the majority of people are in jail for drugs. Drug um, use. Uh, drug or use drug. Or, or drug related crime yeah. or gangs to do with, um, you know, Central South America, all these places. Um, if drugs were legalized, how would the landscape change? You, you, if they were, you wouldn't be criminalizing individuals. I mean, Brazil is another example. You know, they have a zero tolerance policy, as does Paraguay. So if you're caught even with a small amount of drugs, yeah. you end up going to prison. Why is that? I, I think it's because the authorities are scared that they will lose control of the economy if they were allowed to to sell these on the open market. I mean, we all know that legalizing drugs would reduce the, the, the sort of addiction to drugs. Not only would you get, be able to source probably, you know, better kinds of drugs, but I think yeah. the governments of these countries um, would lose control of the economy because you'd have, I mean, they themselves would control it because they could tax it. Yeah. But I think the players involved would become uh, enormously wealthy. And I think that's one of the, 
the, the issues. I, I, I'm sure there's more, but I think legalizing drugs, even the class A drug, would yeah. make a difference in reducing, you know, the prison population, yeah. the drug addicts, um, and, and just the black market that exists. Yeah, because that's the that's where all the the problems lie, isn't it? So so because when I because I look at it, at things, you know, I from afar most things, I, I you know. I look at the, I try and oversee it. And when I watch your show, I look at all the people in, in jails. It's all drug related gangs, crimes, or like even people, you know, cutting people's heads off is just like insane. And it's all gang crime related. If they legalize drugs, and there's an argument that why don't they legalize drugs? Is it because America wants to keep poor uh, countries poor? They don't want them to have any export. Because yeah, the UK is one of the biggest, ex well, it's the biggest exporters of weed, right? Mm. Importers exporters of weed yeah I it's, don't the, know that. it's bigger I... than canada is it really which how does that make any sense right yeah you, you mean the people that manufacture it somewhere here in the uk and we're, then sell it on yeah we're not allowed to use it we're not allowed to you know or I, I don't know what the limits are now but we're the biggest exporter i think it's weed or something like um uh whatever it is but it, we're bigger than canada so it's all government decisions is it because the america wants to keep all these countries poor because if they did ex start exporting or, you know drugs all around the world and, and you know like people say like if uh, drugs were legal it doesn't mean i'm going to go out and become a heroin addict tomorrow obviously i'm not gonna you know do that um, I do. <laughs> no i don't think so <clears throat> um uh but it's you know it's like um that's what i wonder sometimes i'm like if it was legalized the landscape in south america central america would be completely different because it's like if you forget drugs and say i don't know biscuits right if you start selling biscuits legally to get to sell your biscuits you have to create a brand you have to do it properly you have to employ really smart people the money goes straight back and reinvesting constantly if if drugs were legal it'd be the same so you bring out a, a cocaine or whatever it is from colombia you'd have to brand that you'd have to it would have to you know there'll be a uh, it would be regulated so that it's you know proper stuff it's not mixed with like powder soap powder whatever people mix it with yeah so if they if they do legalize it wouldn't it create millions of jobs it would create infrastructure it would create um basically what we have in the western world you know in the uk america um and it you know i think i don't know it, what's the reason that they're not legalizing it i think the flip side to legalizing drugs and i don't know where i sit on this i think yeah. you're absolutely right if they regulated the, the drug industry, it would bring billions and billions of pounds into countries all over the world, especially yeah. poor countries who manufacture and export drugs. You know, they themselves would become wealthier countries in the yeah. same way that, y y you know, other minerals or, or whatever are exported sugar. from countries, sugar, yeah. diamonds, alcohol, coffee, it, it itself, caffeine, whatever it is. Yeah. I think it would um, increase the wealth of those countries, you know, like Colombia or South America, where, you know, cocaine in yeah. particular is, is, is exported. But the flip side to legalizing drugs, the, the one thing that I would worry about is, like you say, you wouldn't take heroin, even if it was legalized and available. Yeah. But there is a temptation that because it is legal, people will try it. And once they try it, they can become, because these are addictive drugs, so they do mm -hmm. pose a threat because even if legalizing it would have a dramatic and it would without a shadow of a doubt it would have a dramatic effect on criminalization so less people would go into prison and all the crimes that are committed yeah. around drugs but it wouldn't stop individuals who get high on drugs committing violent crimes and stuff so you still have that to deal with and yeah. maybe one of the arguments would be that if it was readily accessible through you know, WH Smith's or one of the high street yeah. shops or, or from your backyard, that it would increase usage, although we have millions and millions of people using drugs, but it yeah. would increase usage by people who don't use drugs. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could make the argument that the same goes for alcohol or, mm -hmm. or tobacco, yeah. um, but I think they're less attractive than cocaine or the effects of cigarettes, you know, it damages your health. It yeah. doesn't make you, whereas drink can have a, so I think there is a flip side to the coin. I find it a difficult one, but I think there is there is an industry there. And I, I personally yeah. think they should legalize drugs um, yeah. and regulate it so that it would reduce the, the threat that it, it currently poses to, to the world. I mean, the other side of it is you could outprice it. So it would be super expensive. 
So instead of cocaine being however much it is, 100 pounds. Then that would in itself create a black market, wouldn't it? Where if you're going to charge someone a tenner, yeah. that they can then get it off the black market for a fiver, it would still have competition, wouldn't but, it? That's the thing. I mean, like, would the usage be any different to what it is now? We don't know, do we? And we wouldn't be able to find out unless they legalise it. I think in some countries where they've legalised cannabis and they regulate it and monitor yeah. it in the Netherlands, etc. Yeah. Um, in Canada, um, it, it, it's not had the, the the down effect that people suspected it would do. Or those yeah. that argue against legalisation are yeah. able to care. But I think you're right. You know, I think you know, Western countries or wealthy countries have a vested interest in not allowing Other it to country. be legalised because of the challenge their financial growth would have on their countries yeah the, the whole thing i don't know what it is but something doesn't sit right with me it and it's like because you look at alcohol a great example um and it, it's a drug you know people get addicted people die of it you know it's like my dad was an alcoholic when i was a kid and he stopped when i was about eight um you know and it like it so should that be banned what, like what you know it's such an interesting subject well, it was at one time prohibition it was you know yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then it created i mean without prohibition yeah you wouldn't have the drug cartels that you have today coming out of, of colombia for example because that's what drove that whole prohibition open doors for people to smuggle yeah. alcohol and then that opened the door for drugs and it's just snowballed hasn't it yeah it's so it's like such a fascinating area because it i i think they should and why they haven't already experimented by legalizing certain drugs so that they can regulate it. Um, I, I, I do believe that in years to come, it will be legalized. Yeah. I think, you know, like things have been in the past, you know, uh, uh, strongly opposed by politicians and people who have a vested interest, I think in due course, yeah. they will legalize drugs. For yeah. the reasons you, you state, John, you know, I think it will change. It yeah. has to change unless they want to keep building these prisons like and you know which are you know they're private companies they need people in there um they're doing it in the uk apparently or they're l looking at it these um, supermax prisons they've already built one i think and in cardiff and they're thinking about building more i mean at the moment they don't have prisoners to go in there but yeah they're gonna have so, to fill them from somewhere so they will be criminalizing people yeah so okay so here's the thing if you legalize drugs who who are you going to put in jail i mean obviously there's murderers stuff like that but how, what percentage of um criminals in in prison are to do with drugs do you know yeah i i, I don't um but i suspect a huge i we'll suspect a huge yeah. number yeah um so, a, a so drug you rem related you remove that empty prisons everyone's going to be happy and high no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> high as shit yeah it's, it's a hard one to argue isn't it because it you know my, my initial thought is that when you legalize drug it exposes people to drugs that wouldn't otherwise be exposed to drug you yourself I, have I, never taken drugs yeah i, I have. have i have yeah oh, i have yeah yeah i i didn't take drugs when i was 27 i went to amsterdam had a mushroom and laughed for four hours and ate a mcdonald's <laughs> donut and it tasted like plasticine i'll never forget it and i was looking at a map and it looked like spaghetti um, I tried cocaine once and I hated it. It didn't, it, I reacted not well to it. Didn't do that. Um, I've tried MDMA. That's bloody great. You know, um, a tiny bit when I was in Ibiza. Um, but it, I don't do drugs. You know, it's not like I think, oh, I really want to go out and do drugs. Like, but obviously when I was 17, 18, I drank alcohol. You know, when I got hammered, puked up all over myself, like every kid in the UK. I mean, some do a lot younger. Um, and, you know, but it was because it, because obviously, that's what everyone did, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm just like everybody else, you know? I've tried things, you know, obviously I haven't done heroin or anything like that. No plans to do that. Um, but just cause you try it, you know, some people drink alcohol and don't like it, you know? Mm. It's like, it's going, you know, it's going to go that way. I just, when I, watching your show really sort of like put it into con context for me and I thought they're all in here for drugs, you know, they're chopping each other's heads off because they've got uh, drug gangs like that shouldn't be happening like I, but I, I suppose the other question somewhere like Paraguay or South American countries for example you're, you're absolutely right the majority of individuals in there are because they're drug users or they're drug dealers yeah the, the, the concern with and, and also also sorry to interrupt but if they've committed a murder it's 
because of drugs maybe or or you know generally yes in those sorts of countries yeah. here maybe not so but i yeah. suppose the other thing if you take away that black market for those individuals there is no other source of income because that is their income the black yeah. market if you wiped that market out from the disadvantaged in those countries they would then become unemployed even though they're already unemployed or employed even. because they've got lots of good experience in a new market potentially right potential i can't see it working like that i think if governments took control of drugs they would quickly like they do everything else you know the big companies would come in and they would control it and yes they pharma would employ companies. people the pharmaceutical yeah. Yeah. companies but yeah. they would employ people but not the same way a street dealer is employed by someone i've always felt that you, you know if, if these guys who sell drugs they're entrepreneurs you know they yeah. have foot soldiers they have skills that you have i yeah. don't because they are entrepreneurs if they can yeah. import cocaine cannabis or whatever it is and distribute it yeah. in the way that they do they could do the same with guava jelly or something yeah. else like they coffee um, yeah. but i think those guys wouldn't be able to access the legalized drugs because governments yeah. would tax it in the same way they do alcohol these guys are not on the street selling alcohol and it's yeah. legalized so i think they would be cut out of the market good thing bad thing i don't know and it, i mean it does it does reflect their environment they have nothing and that's because the government don't put any money back into their communities you know it's like they just have nothing you know that's so. the bigger issue isn't it i think the bigger issue is that the the disadvantaged backgrounds that many of these people come to turn to drugs because of that you know as a way of making a living or yeah. a way of escaping their reality i mean yeah. that's simplifying it. it's a lot more complex than that sure but the reality is is that most of these individuals who end up going to prison have underlying disadvantage problems social yeah. problems that that trigger their use of drugs yeah. or selling drugs to make a living sometimes it's the easy option you know rather than knocking on someone's door yeah. shop trying to get properly employed yeah. they just turn to a drug dealer and start distributing their drugs or using it you, have you seen the film the purge yes i the purge the purge where they go around at midnight every you get 24 hours to yes um, i have seen it okay so Let's do that for legalizing drugs. 24 and, hours? No, a year. Let's just legalize drugs for a year all around the world and see what happens. Take a year just to get it into the market, wouldn't it? It well, would be a challenge. I mean, it's there. They just have to brand it, right? Imagine, say, like this is hypothetical. This is what I think about at night, weirdly. Um, a year, legalize everything, see what happens, but just have everyone to agree, get, get an app, and says, I'm gonna sell drugs, but this is what I agree to. If I'm if I'm a dick, then in twelve months I go to jail. Yeah. If I do it properly, I employ people, pay taxes, do my accounts properly, blah, 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 then they'll let me carry on after twelve months. Why not? I, I also think the usage would drop. I think if yeah. you legalize drugs, the amount of people using drugs would probably drop. And I know that goes yeah. against what I said a moment ago, which is, you know, it could introduce new people to drugs. Yeah. But I think the, the attraction sometimes to certain kinds of drugs is this kind of dark living, isn't it? It's kind well, of this scurrying around, yeah. kind of doing something that's not um, in conformity to, to what society does. You know, yeah. people get a buzz out of doing things that are against the system, if you like. Yeah. And that would be wiped out overnight. True. And also, um, a lot of people that aren't working do drugs because they don't really have much to do or, or there's a, a percentage of people, you know, if they're all employed by the new drug industry that we've just created today, um, w they'll be too busy. You'd like to think it's that simple, wouldn't you? Of course. It, you you got to be... Uh... <laughs> I think you'd like to think it's that simple. I think the challenge is if they're all employed selling drugs, they're not taking it anymore. And so there's no one to sell it to, you know, because <laughs> yeah. they're too busy, what? you know. And the problem yeah. is these, these are not drugs... I mean, like you say, you experimented. You yeah. liked it. Some didn't work for you. Yeah, yeah. Some people, they get addicted to it. And so it's not... Yeah. You know, if you get addicted to taking cocaine or crack or some kind of drug like that, then you can't function when you yeah. become addicted to it where yeah. it becomes your sole source of, of living you yeah. can't function and therefore those people that are being employed to sell drugs yeah. would again be cut out of the market you know and yeah and to supply their habit they would still commit crime so maybe it would increase burglaries or street robberies because yeah. you know well, I, 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 for some reason I, I, just my gut feeling says that if it was legalized based on the amount that's consumed now that's enough to probably employ like a billion people. Definitely. Right? So if just based on, not that we're gonna try and like hypersell drugs like next week, 
if we just based on the amount of drugs that are consumed by the world now and then we put that into some kind of like um company or like company structure or economy how much tax would that create for communities how many jobs would it create how many people would it get out of jail how many murders would it stop how many kidnappings would it stop i think it'll outweigh the negative it'll be more positive i i agree and i think the first thing if they did legalize drugs and the billions that it would generate is that you could quite quickly provide the therapy for those that yeah. are addicted to drugs yeah. so you can you know almost wipe out that problem o overnight or at least over a longer uh, period i mean it's a good argument john yeah. and it's something i think a lot of people even politicians you know yeah. they, these conversations have been going on for a long time behind yeah. closed doors and openly in in governments um I, I think the argument is sort of halfway, I yeah. think, for the for and against. Um, so yeah. as I say, I think in due course, legalizing drugs is going to be something that you and I might see in our lifetime. Yeah. And I think your show will have something to do with it because it's made me think like this, if that makes sense. Like me watching like a BBC show about prison does nothing. But seeing your one and seeing how much drug related crime and it's basically all drug related. Um, we'll look back in 20 years and be like that your show was responsible for making people think like that you know it's it's even this conversation is like it's you know it's got me really thinking well it's really interesting because i've never thought of it like that you know i walk into somewhere like these south american prisons and i speak to these prisoners and they're in there for taking drugs and committing crimes as yeah. a result of taking drugs or they themselves are drug dealers yeah. and while they're in prison there's still this black market you know their desperation to access drugs yeah. i was really spending a lot of time thinking about the individual humanizing these individuals and trying yeah. to look at who they are without trying to judge where they've come from although yeah. that's evident based on the stories they they tell me i've never looked at it like that and i think it's an interesting concept to look at how these prisons um, would change significantly i mean there are other impacts paraguay for example demonstrating to people that the resources and and the lack of if you like in somewhere yeah. like paraguay where people are living like dogs and there's no other way yeah. to describe it has driven the government in paraguay to build a new prison because the conditions were so horrendous that the country itself has been embarrassed by this show that i did yeah. that i've now been told that the paraguayan government are building a new prison so that the prisoners in that prison can be moved that doesn't address the drugs problem but maybe they will provide better accommodation and i use that term yeah, loosely yeah. where they can then deal with the underlying problems of of these prisoners yeah like what you just said like i mean that's your show has made me think like that right so i mean millions of people watch your show um i'm sure p people that watch it and, and come out of a different sort of thought process yeah. this is mine um which is why i was so keen to talk to you about these mm. things um like what you just said then is like it's almost like we're having a meeting imagine we're in number 10 right now we're talking mm. about drugs i mean it's not uh, uh, obviously in south america you know and central america it's way different to us that that i think that needs addressing before anything talk about the people kind of you know it's just insane um when you said about the rehabilitation that can be taken out of the taxes you can just allocate a certain amount yeah that goes to like um victims families you know all these types of things that can be just taken out of the taxes you can like even now they're taxing sugar more they're taxing um, tobacco more petrol more just tax that more you can just tax it more and then all of a sudden you can put all this money back into the communities and in 20 30 years time the difference would be like insane i i wonder uh, you know as you talk about it and i think about it i i, I think it's probably a, a lot to do with who would own those businesses you know at yeah. the moment a lot of what exists at the moment whether it's sugar whether it's alcohol yeah. are owned by particular individuals yeah. you know that five percent of the wealth yeah uh, um when you're talking about drugs you're talking about the I hesitate to say the pablo escobars of the world you know people yeah. who have been created as a result of their their, their drug industry and yeah. so they would have to be those types of people even though many of them are business men or women anyway yeah. Yeah. they would have to be brought into the equation so can you imagine those individuals sitting down at 10 downing street trying to convince boris that it's in the the british public's interest that yeah. they legalize the the well, importation and, of drugs. And, I, and i would say not that i'm like pablo escobar but i would say well you're bloody using it already you're consuming shit loads of it you might as well just like tax it and build put put it in a, to a good cause um and i mean you look at 
um, you look at monopolies. There's monopoly laws. You can't have, you can't own everything, you know. And it, you just apply the same things to this industry. It's just another industry. You you just yeah. There's so many things that we've already learned that we can just translate into that industry. So it sounds like I'm trying to like like I'm an ambassador for getting drugs like and you don't even use drugs maybe you're a seeker maybe you've made all your wealth from drug importation <laughs> yeah i'm the biggest export John of is weed a drug dealer he's not <laughs> telling you and so he's trying to convince before he gets caught and ends up in one of these prisons that i've been exposing you know no, he's trying to advocate that legalize it before they catch it's me. your fault gotcha. it's your show it's got me thinking like this but I, I was like doing my research and there's a stat here and we're talking about more drug use in prisons so in the uk it's gone from eight, like prisons create more drug addicts. It's gone from 8% to 15% in the UK. Like I can't imagine what it's like in Brazil and all these other, but if our system is creating that, I mean, there's a problem, obviously. I'll give you a hard reality. I, when I was in prison, yeah. um, the, the, the main drug was cannabis. So yeah. everybody in prison would have a joint. You know, so that was what was circulating. Yeah. Cocaine wasn't big. Ecstasy had just come on the scene on the outside. So we've seen a lot of what, prisoners. What year was this? This was in the 90s. Okay. So yeah. in the early 90s, mid 90s, yeah. ecstasy had just come on the scene. So I started to see prisoners coming into prison who were glazed by the ecstasy tab. I think they took one too many and they were still kind of loving it up in prison. But the reality is what, what, what the British authorities did is they introduced mandatory drug tests. Yeah. That meant that if you, had, if you were randomly taken by the prison guards, taken to a room, you give a piss sample, yeah. they check to see whether you had any cannabis in your system. Now, if you take cannabis, it stays in your system for three or four weeks. Right. So what happened is a lot of prisoners that I knew, 80% of prisoners that I knew that were just having a puff, that was their drug of choice, that yeah. was the easy thing, and guards would turn a blind eye to it. Yeah. They started to beat the system and the drug test because it, it threatened, it meant if they got caught, they would have their sentence extended or they would have a report put against their names so yeah. when they were due to be released, it would extend <clears throat> their time in prison. So a lot of prisoners who were just puffing then turned to heroin because heroin, you could have a hit and you know it'd be out your system in two or three days so when you just said a lot of prisoners in this country you, you know have the, or the numbers in terms of prisoners taking drugs has increased i saw that for myself yeah. i saw guys that are as good as you and me on a joint all of a sudden becoming heroin addicts who were running around trying to score a bit of heroin and it increased dramatically in the years that i was in prison it was a sad thing to see you know i mean they were criminals and they were doing time and they were having a puff all of a sudden they become a different kind of criminal a drug addict in prison and i know many of them have come out and gone on to continue looking to support their drug habit because when you become a heroin addict it's yeah, hard and now we've got spice and other kind of drugs in prison so i've witnessed it for myself john that when yeah. when they don't legalize something like cannabis instead they do the opposite and they then start challenging the usage of something that is in my view a lot less harmless than, than other A-class drugs. Yeah. It creates a bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? I saw it for myself. You know, guys I was talking to, they were as good as gold, and then, you know, overnight they become heroin addicts. And I'm talking about big numbers. Just because of the, the system? Because the system introduced a test, and, and why they introduced the test, uh, nobody knows. You know, smoking cannabis in prison at that time wasn't a big problem. In yeah. fact, you know, the guards kind of turned a blind eye to it simply because it kept the peace. You know, it was a calmer yeah, kind yeah. of way, a bit of puff floating around, didn't cause any problems. It was a commodity, sure, and 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 there was a black market. But you yeah. know, somebody wouldn't go and stab someone for a bit of cannabis, whereas yeah. they would seriously kill somebody for, for heroin they're that desperate to, to score and it's harder or it yeah. was in those days it was harder to score heroin in prison than it was a bit of cannabis what's the biggest exporter is it uh, export is it cocaine then is it or is it heroin that well, that big well i i think it's the big, like in, in know, terms of yeah. drugs now it, it's meths isn't it i think meths really? have overtaken cocaine so in america and i think in the uk um you, you know from south america whereas cocaine used to be be the biggest export yeah. is now meths you know this crystal really? which people are using that is the biggest biggest you know the the, the drug cartels of the world the colombian drug yeah. cartels and other south american drug cartels they turn to meth they import more meths to america than they do anywhere else in the world. And so it's overtaken cocaine. 
Well, I mean, when you look at America, it doesn't surprise you, does it? It doesn't surprise you. No. <laughs> They're all on meth. <laughs> Starting with old Trump, see. Yeah. Oh, my God. You've it got to wonder what is going on. No, <laughs> maybe don't let America have any more drugs. Maybe, like, ban them guys. Um, but, yeah, what a place that is. Um, yeah, my, I, my, another question I want to ask you. If you were to design, if you, if you had all the money and you had to design your own prison, what would it look like? And what would you call it? <laughs> what would I call it? I, yeah, I, I'll have to think about that. I think, I think if I was to design my own prison, I had the architects at my at, at disposal, it would be somewhere like what I saw in Norway. Okay. They've created a space that is um, unique. You know, not only is the infrastructure of the prison yeah. modern yeah. Um, and it provides the right backdrop, you know, so you're not looking out of, of a cell window through bars they don't have bars in their prison so one of the first things i would do is get rid of this symbolic symbol of having bars you know you imagine you've got bars you've got hands around yeah. bars that's not the reality of prison but prisons were built on concrete and steel so i'd get rid of bars and create these kind of reinforced windows which um, creates light and space for the simple reason that i think when you're in a prison cell the darkness and the dinginess of a prison cell can bring your mood down so there are little things that they did in norway that i think makes a difference so the infrastructure of a prison you know a bit like ikea i think that's how some people have described it is like yeah get whoever it is who creates the swedish furniture for ikea and put it inside that prison because that's what it was like that's not to say that the cells are no different yeah. it's just what they have in those cells whether it's a television yeah. or a, a bigger bed a shower or whatever yeah. so my prison would be like a flat and that's not because prisoners deserve luxury. Yeah. I think what you're creating then is rehabilitation. Yeah. And the next thing would be who you employ to work in those prisons. And I think that's key yeah. to preventing the next victim. So yeah. it's training and employing people who treat criminals, regardless of their crimes, yeah. like human beings. Because I think once you get into the mindset of these criminals, you can change their lives. And it's not just about the criminals, as I say, it's about the victims that they will go on to commit crimes yeah. against once they are released, if you don't deal with them when they're in prison. So the infrastructure would be a kind of modern day IKEA kind of prison. I so mean, IKEA to me feels like prison anyway, which is why I don't go. Because you, once you, you're you can in, afford better furniture. No, so. no, it's not. No, no, I still buy. But, but, but it's the simpleness. All I'm yeah. saying is that the prison for me it has to be simple and functional, but yeah. it also has to provide a space where you can create uh, better human beings. Yeah. You know, humanizing individuals. You know, British yeah. prisons, these old Victorian places that I spent time in and that are so contained, they just create a cloud over the head of all kinds of prisoners, and, and that in itself causes problems. You, okay, so but okay, so when I asked you that question, what's your, what would be like the perfect prison, you're not coming at it from a business plan, right? And like you said, these supermax prisons, they need prisoners to fund it, blah, blah, blah. So it makes you wonder, the prisons that we have, I mean, w we think that someone goes into jail they come out rehabilitated and they're a good citizen. But the reality is what how one percent of prisons are probably doing that. Really they're just going in hell holes, joining gangs in some places, killing people inside prison or witnessing it, coming out even more of a um scarred person or however, um, and if anything affiliated or owe people money by the time they get out. What the hell's going on? The reality is a lot different, John. You know, you simplify it, but, but I think when we talk about rehabilitation, that's just kind of a loose word to describe what you do with individuals. When you talk about building prisons, and I go back to the Norwegian prison, not yeah. only did they build a space that looked like IKEA, but within that prison, and this is where your entrepreneurial skills come in or businesses come in, is that you create spaces where businesses yeah. can import their their product services or whatever so you yeah. train prisoners how to become mechanics so you give people real prospect yeah. of a job so you train them but that could be for whatever product or service so not only would the prison be designed in a way where you can import businesses into prison so if they do have to have prisons and they do have numbers of prisoners you have businesses within yeah. prisons where prisoners are giving meaningful work and therefore they're learning a skill or a trade yeah and they come out and a lot of that does go on but it goes on on such a small scale and i don't think it's because of the lack of will of businesses i think businesses yeah. 
are sometimes accused of exploiting prisoners and, yeah. and this kind of marketplace. But the reality is most of these guys will sit in their cells all day long anyway, especially in these third world countries where yeah. they don't have the resources. You know, businesses have the resources to go in, build a block and put in their machinery so yeah. prisoners can learn a skill. That happens in Norway and they are so successful in yeah. reducing the recidivism rate. So people who are coming out of prison and going on to commit further crimes have yeah. been reduced in Norway like no one else nowhere else because they have invested in wanting to rehabilitate yeah. prisoners yeah i mean if you the, a lot of people that go to prison went there because they had no opportunity and they turned to crime or whatever they did if they come out with an opportunity the chances of them coming back are a lot more slim you're a perfect example you you studied journalism when you're in in prison right I, I did, yeah. I yeah. studied journalism. I mean, my motives were not to come out and become a journalist like I did. You did really well at that, by the way. I'm doing very well, thank you. <laughs> um, but, but, but that, you know, journalism is just a title. It's yeah. about what I do as an individual, what my morals and values are. That's yeah. what it comes down to. You know, I can be a, a brilliant journalist running around. I mean, I yeah. spent my early career as a journalist undercover. So most of the work I did, I took on a persona right. that was a part of my prison existence. Yeah. Uh, and what I knew, so I could go undercover into places like Sierra Leone, which I did, and yeah. I'd bought conflict diamonds, and I smuggled those diamonds back to the UK. So I was using the skill set I discovered in, in prison yeah. and in the world that I grew up in, and applied it to my journalism. So right. you know, there would not, I don't think any journalist has ever done that before when I'd done it. You know, smuggling diamonds, buying diamonds undercover, and smuggling them back to the UK, taking them to Hatton Garden, and trying to offer them to. to Wait, do why were you doing that? I was exposing the the conflict diamond trade. The the the. But the, what if you got caught? That's a good question. I, I <laughs> you didn't think about this. <laughs> well, well, I did, but I I was hoping that at the time the BBC were on my side. I did it as a BBC journalist, and it was for a documentary at the time. People like Miss Dynamite were singing songs about diamonds and, and bling and, and McQueen, yeah, yeah. the diamond yeah, yeah. Um, kind of designer. There was a lot of bling in the country. There was a lot of songs being made about diamonds and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I wanted to expose the fact that many of these diamonds that we men or women buy for their partners as a, a token of, of love or engagement were clean? actually coming from places where people were being killed losing their limbs and, and Sierra Leone was one of these places where you know the militia were selling diamonds chopping people's arms so that's why I did it I wanted to expose the conflict diamond trade yeah. and in order to do that the, the Europe had just introduced a certification process so any diamond dealer anywhere in the world yeah. had to have a certificate with any diamond they traded with so that had been introduced and so what I wanted to show is that this certification process was not worth the paper it was written on. Fast. So I went to Sierra Leone. And what, and what year was this? This was in 2002, 2003. It's not even that, that long ago. Not that long ago, 17 years ago. So most people wearing diamonds on their fingers or whatever around their necks. They just don't know, do they? Well, I like to think that that certification process has improved and it's got tighter. But when I did it, you know, there I am in Sierra Leone buying diamonds, plugging them, smuggling them back to the UK, taking them out, taking them to Hatton Garden. And we're not talking about Christine diamonds that look like you have in rings. I'm talking about black stones. If you didn't know it was a diamond, you think it was just a thing and throw it to one side. But I took these into Hatton Gardens and I was showing them to diamond dealers. They were looking at them through their little glasses and saying, yeah, I'll buy them. And I was secretly filming them and I'm sort of saying, but do you not want a certificate? And they were saying, no. I don't need a certificate. So that just fueled the problem of what was going in, going on in, in these countries. Why did we start talking about my diamond trade? Well, it's about journalism, oh, journal it? But, but that's the thing. So, di so, so diamonds, obviously people are getting killed and all sorts of stuff. That's an industry that's legal. It is, <laughs> it is. It is an industry that is, is, is legal, but it's how you go about the legality. Like I say, exposing the certification process is what I was doing yeah. it. But you asked the question about journalism. Yeah, in, and oh, so studying in um, And so prison, studying so. journalism in prison, my motives were, were, were really to, to get the media on side. I needed, I was in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Yeah. I was trying to expose that fact. I'd yeah. already been convicted. I wanted to expose that fact to the general public so I could yeah. win their support, but yeah. more importantly, you know, influence the courts when they came to consider my case that the journalists were yeah. now saying something's wrong so people would sit up and listen. That's why I embarked on a journalism course. Yeah, and um, there's corruption everywhere, obviously. 
and you've pretty much been everywhere what's the most corrupt country that you've been to don't say england probably well, is <laughs> well the fact is we do it better than anyone else because we have the gift of the gab we've don't got good we? lawyers it's not just about the lawyers it's the language you know people it, it's the language the, the, the corruption in this country does come down to how people talk themselves out of corners and our politicians do it better than anyone else they lie 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 or they mislead mm -hmm. i'm not saying every politician is like that but they get away with it because they're able to talk themselves out of corners in other countries it's not as easy you know they expose themselves to it's difficult to identify which countries, and, and I've been in lots of situations where corruption, I'll give you an example. I was in um, Ghana. I was yeah. um, tracking the illegal um, disposal of waste goods. So here in this yeah. country, when you've got a television and it's broken and you take it to the local amenity site or the dump site, yeah. it's supposed to be destroyed by a recycling firm. Yeah. And what was happening, a lot of these old technical technology goods televisions yeah. and other things were being piled up in trucks exported to places like africa and then they were being dismantled by kids on these kind of dump sites who were being poisoned and affected by these goods um, and selling the little minerals that you find inside whether it's a phone or a, or a television and yeah. i remember being in ghana on one of these um, port sites so i'd s sneaked in undercover and um, I was secretly filming these containers being opened and I put trackers in the items that I'd sold from a shop. So I set up a shop here in the UK, right. hired a recycling firm who I knew were dodgy and they were coming to the shop, take my goods, put them on their truck. Now they're supposed to recycle them here in the UK legally. And what they were actually doing was putting them on containers and shipping them out to Africa. So I tracked them, watched them cross the channel and right. then went to those countries and Ghana was one of them. When I was in the port, and I identified the location of where my goods were coming from. I was then leaving the port and I got stopped by two port guards and they took me into a room and I had a secret camera on yeah. and they started, what are you doing in this port? Where's your identification? They were not interested in why I was in the port or what my identification is. They just wanted money. So at that level, I had to dip my hands in my pocket, grab all the US dollars I had and just give it to them. And I caught all this on camera and then they kind of patted me on the back. So corruption starts at the very lower level, um, but it's endorsed by politicians and I think yeah. other senior people in particular in those countries. Um, but all countries are corrupt. There's no country that's not corrupt, but it's not the country, it's the individuals who are in a position of power driven by money of course it's mental isn't it you just think because you think you, you look around and you think ah oh, seems all right we turn a blind eye don't we because as long as you're all right you don't care to some extent i mean people do care and i think my netflix show is one of those shows where i've personally been blown away by the audience's reaction to yeah. what they're seeing generally people you know they, they turn a blind eye to what prisons are like what the conditions are like the people that are in prison but i've been surprised internationally yeah. by the way the audience has reacted to this either by the way you've reacted thinking look there is an entrepreneur opening here or a business proposition or it's dri I've driven you to think about legalizing drugs yeah um y y you know i've been buoyed by the fact that people have contacted me and sort of said what can i do how can i make a difference is there a foundation da -dee -da, -dee da people yeah. want to make and that makes me think that there are good people all over the world who have never been exposed to what i'm exposing them to yeah. you'd think that they would know what it's like in a south american prison in brazil or paraguay but people are contacting me in hundreds and saying to me I didn't know that's how we treated our fellow human beings. They've done wrong. They deserve to be in prison. Yeah. But the corruption of the guards, but, et yeah. cetera. It's, it's mad. And it's because they have no money and they're not paying the guards, you know, yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. I mean, it's like if they legalize drugs, that's not an industry I would go into. Like, but when I watch your show, I think, because I think there was one, there was one show where you left a, a prison and I can't remember what you said, but it, like, it resonated with me where you said that they can't do this until they sort this problem out. And I thought to myself, well, the bigger problem is legalizing drugs. Because if you did that, then there, there would, I doubt if that prison would exist, you know? Because every crime seemed to re relate back to drugs, like whether it's murder. Because you think, oh, murder, someone's killed their, their ex-wife or their ex-husband. But really, it's drug-related. They're murdering people because, you know, it's all gangs and stuff like that. So you if you remove that and it creates jobs, 
and it creates money for communities. And we're, I mean, everyone's consuming drugs anyway. So just based on what people are consuming now. And I think the biggest problem is America. I think American prisons are driven by private companies. You, yeah. you, know, you know, they need prisoners. And like you say, most of the prisoners are drug users, drug dealers. You know, that's what the majority yeah. of their prisons are made up of um, and will continue to be if drugs are not legalized. Um, but I think the picture is bigger and deeper uh, and more complex. Yeah. Um, than our simple trying to put it right. Yeah. I mean, what gives me a headache is the fact that it has so far to go. There's so much work to be done. Like you say that, John, but I think it's simple. It just requires somebody in a position of power to have the confidence to not be scared of the reaction that they will get yeah. from others, you know, because there are people in a position who can make that decision by the stroke yeah. of a pen. And although it might be controversial at the very moment, as time goes on, people will see that that's the right decision. And those things and, and things, I can't think of an example, but yeah. those things happen. The Mandela is the classic, isn't yeah. it? You know, here is a man that was described as all the things he was described as, spent all those years in prison as a terrorist, but actually ends up becoming a prime minister by the stroke yeah. of somebody's pen. They yeah. recognize that what was going on in South Africa and apartheid was, was wrong, but for a very long time, people ignored it from outside of South Africa. Once they addressed the problem, everybody wanted to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. And, and I know it's not easy to compare that with the legalization of drugs, but yeah. my point is it only takes someone, and that is somebody at the head of government yeah. or in a position to sign on a piece of paper and everybody will fall in line. Donald Trump did it tomorrow, Boris Johnson would do it the day after. Of course, yeah, of course. I mean, if you think about it, like, if tomorrow legalizing drugs happened, and everyone that sells drugs to people in this country went on um, company's house, created uh, Shoreditch Drugs Limited and started paying tax from tomorrow, right? So they go and sell 500 quid worth of Coke to mate around the corner, got a receipt, 20% corporation tax, put his costs through it, all that kind of stuff. How much, based on today's consumption, we're not, you know, how much tax would that create and what could we do what good could we do with that tax based on the current consumption we're talking billions and mm. billions and how much of that could go back into rehab for people that have you know got drug issues stuff like that building you know pay, paying for places for them to um, get the rehab they need it just l seems to make sense it's a no-brainer yeah it, isn't it so you do wonder why it's not already been done um you know you and i are not privy to to bits of information that may be what they use, and I'm talking about politicians and people in power, maybe their decision is based on information that you and I don't have access to. Yeah. It seems like a no-brainer. You're absolutely right. It would, it, it would wipe out a problem overnight, you, yeah. you, you know, because people, like you say, the billions that would be generated from legalizing drugs yeah. could do so much good. It yeah. would alleviate so many people's problems. Yeah. Um, and in particular, the worst problems that we face, you know, drug fueled crime. Yeah. And if it was going to, a, a, you know, like the tax was going to a good, good place, I'll start taking drugs. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I'll care. I'll start spending loads of money. No, I don't <laughs> care what you say. I'm convinced that you want legalized drugs so you can get out your business that you've got going no, on hidden. Honestly, no, I, uh, people like, I get offered things like to do different things, but I only like stick to things that like uh, work. Illegal. In, no, stick, yeah, no, no, the opposite actually. Um, that, that are like based on my lifestyle, like travel or fitness and stuff like that. Because I've only got seven days a week, like I, I don't have enough time to do more businesses stuff like that. I do this because I meet fascinating people like you that I have so many questions for, um, but my mind is like based on you know um, solving a business question or you know or like you know like. I look at the prisons and I'm like, they shouldn't be there. Like the, the and, and that's an interesting thing because, uh, you know, I don't sit in the company of entrepreneurs, businessmen like you very often um, uh, and talk about what influence you could have or your mindset, uh, business mindset could have on prisons. I mean, I mentioned the fact that businesses could do a lot more to invest their companies in prisons. And I think in some regards, they do, Virgin Media, Marks and Spencers, you know, a lot of people don't realize, and I shouldn't blacklist this, but you know, people don't realize that those guys driving these trucks who deliver their shopping, whether it's Ocado or Tesco's or something, yeah. a lot of these guys are ex-offenders coming out, people that work in Timpsons. Yeah. And these guys, they found a purpose, you know, 
and they have worked. But these businesses do invest in giving people a second chance, employing ex-offenders. Um, it's a challenge because I think at the beginning of our conversation, we talked about would you rather live next door to a murderer yeah. or, or a convicted repeat offender who is a, robber. a thief, a yeah, robber. A thief, yeah. I just think um, that businesses could do more. Yeah. You, you know, you talk about Paraguay or Lesotho, the other prison I was in in South Africa. They have absolutely no resources. But I do think if a... And they want, they want businesses to come into their prisons yeah. with the permissions of their government to train prisoners and give them a purpose. So they're yeah. not just sitting there for 10 years and then they come out a worse person than they was when they went in, even though they were bad when they went in. Yeah. I just think businesses can do a lot. What are they scared of? Yeah. Exactly. I think we just legalize drugs for a month and just get everyone to set up new companies. And then you could literally track how many new companies were set up over the next day. Cause it's like 30 quid to set up a company online. It costs nothing. And an account, a good accountant will cost you like 1500 quid a year. And then all of a sudden you got a business to the customers that you're already selling drugs to. I mean, it just makes sense. And I think the fascinating thing with who comes out of the woodwork, you know, all these drug dealers. Mum? What the <laughs> Mum, I didn't know you were selling crack. <laughs> I think that's a, two that million be, a year that would generated. Be the story, wouldn't it? That's the revelation. All these people come out the woodwork who you thought were law abiding citizens, and, yeah. and there they are, the major drug dealers. Yeah, you turning know? over like ha half a million a year. Yes, John. Yeah. But paying lots of tax. Yes, go, John. Yeah. yeah. I'm you convinced you're a drug dealer on the oh, side. Oh, no, mate. I, no. You, you, you know what? It's funny. It's like when you're like 19, 20, you all think about it because it's easy money, right? You just sort of think, oh, could I sell drugs? Like, it just everyone seems to buy it as cash. I don't know. So like people get caught up in that world, don't they? They think it's not glamorous, but yeah. they think it's an easy way to make money. And before easy, yeah. they know it, yeah. they ruin their lives because they're yeah. either taking the drugs, they yeah. turn to taking them, yeah. or they end up getting caught, which yeah. inevitably will happen. Yeah. And they end up going to prison and then they become a worse criminal because prisons are places where you are criminally educated. And also I think because you don't really know anyone that sells drugs, you just think no one else is doing it right so you think there's no competition right but if every if it was legal and you saw businesses everywhere you'd be like our oh, route to market is way too expensive i can't compete with these guys and you would be bought out wouldn't you so yeah. the, the, the in terms of those businesses that would set up they would reduce in numbers and then you would yeah. just have the major players wouldn't you yeah. but again that would create a problem that we're talking about right now which is all those small time criminals that end up in prison for yeah. using or selling drugs would still end up using or selling drugs yeah unless they had all the rehab that they could ever want well the therapy would be an important thing i yeah. I, I i totally 100 percent agree with the fact that the money generated from legalizing drugs could do a lot of good around yeah. the world at alleviating the disadvantaged areas and people that get caught up in drugs without a shadow of a doubt yeah. that money could be reinvested as well as do so much more yeah yeah, it's like like you look at if you, you've been to Costa Rica, obviously mm. you, there's a there's a the main uh, motorway that connects everything. There's like two, I think there's one or two. Yeah. But Spain own it, right? And it's a toll, so Spain paid for it to be done. They own it and they get all the toll money. Mm. Like that gives you an idea of how little Costa Rica have, you mm. know, when it comes to like generating taxes and stuff like that. You know, they just don't really have anything there, which is mad. It's a beautiful place, Costa Rica, isn't it? I've got my friend that lives there. He's got a brewery and stuff. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, I've asked him, I, I don't want to say, I've asked him about taxes and he's like, <laughs> yeah, I think you, I think you just give a bit and that's it. There's no yeah. system there. It's, it's mind blowing, you know, um, because it's like you only have, like you say, it's only a few pieces of paper you have to sign and you could get that moving. Um, and eliminate a lot of the crime and all the problems. But is that the problem though? I mean, you know, maybe Costa Rica do it the right way and we do it the wrong way here because, you, you know, we chase people for taxes, prosecute people for, for not being able to do it. I mean, now is a funny time because of, of, of COVID and, yeah. and the impact it's had on people. So a lot of the rules have been relaxed or at least shifted. Yeah. But, you know, there's nothing to say that Costa Rica is not doing it the right way. Yeah, I agree. You know, if they've got a toll road and Spain are taking the revenue, then yeah. that doesn't seem fair. But, um, you know, if you set up a business and you yeah. generate an income and you invest some of that income back into a community, yeah. isn't that money better spent than giving it to the government who then, you know, not only put some in their pocket, but they don't spend it where you'd want to spend it. You yeah. should be able to. And I don't know how it works because I don't run a business, but I'm sure. I, I mean, if, if the government were like, OK, we're going to legalize drugs tomorrow if you set up a company, but 
so say you're a drug dealer i'm imagining yeah because i am not one despite what you, you want to employ me is yeah. that what <laughs> Are you, you know? no so say you're a drug dealer and what you're doing is illegal right so people that are selling drugs are going out there and they don't know if they're going to go home that night right because they might go to jail how much is that worth 50 percent of your revenue probably so if you say okay fine you can sell drugs tomorrow but 50 percent of that's going to get taxed but you won't go to jail they'll be like take my money they might put their prices up a bit like 30 percent, just to kind of offset that but it would make sense you know and all of a sudden you've got absolute probably trillions of pounds getting given to the government it's just not an overnight thing which I, is what I, I i agree with you and, yeah. and and every argument you make here is is logical isn't it it's it's a no-brainer I, I, as i say i think the complexity of it it's it's not as simple as that you know those street drug dealers would disappear overnight because they'll be out marketed by those who can afford yeah. to sell you know open up a shop in the same way these electronic cigarette companies have yeah. and they've potted up everywhere haven't they um and the same would happen with the legalization of drugs um i mean you couldn't have you know different grades of cocaine on shelves and stuff like that so you know there'd have to be a consideration mm -hmm. of how you then sell those drugs. I mean, you can't have street dealers like they are now in the dead of night kind of dishing out little vats of cocaine or yeah, crack yeah. or whatever the yeah. drug is. So, you know, people would have to invest in all sorts of infrastructure to, to make it work, which is not a problem because yeah. I think the money would be there. It'd probably um, be all online. I mean, people wouldn't want to go in and buy coke, would they? They would just buy it online if it was a, you know, a proper plate. You just have it delivered. for everything. I mean, yeah. Tesco can deliver it. Well, the Amazon guy, Bezo, is that his name? It better, yeah. yeah better. He, he'll just take it over, wouldn't he? Just, you know, cocaine by delivery, you know, mark it out everyone else. Yeah, and he doesn't pay tax, so it probably there'll be no rehab anywhere. He'll just be, like, even richer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I mean, Walmart sell guns. I mean... That's America again. Right? Exactly. It's like, the world's mental. One stat I read, actually, is that... Um, I might, I'm pretty sure it's UK. 95% of people in prison are men. Why is that? I think it's I, I, I probably a little less than that, about 80%. I, I, because women don't, I mean, the crime between men and women are very different. Women are generally in prison. It's more economical crimes. Men are in prison for economical crimes, but violence and all sorts of other crimes. The right. majority of women in prison are in for economical crimes. So it's kind of, you know, to feed their drug habit or right. to pay for the things, that, the necessities. Um, or you know prostitution or things that are um, considered illegal um, but it's more out of desperation you know most women are not in it there are a small majority that are in for violent offenses probably driven by drugs but yeah the percentage is because women just don't behave in the same way men do they're not driven in the same yeah. way that men now some people would argue it's biological i don't have an argument either side but you're absolutely right the the, the amount of women in prison is significantly smaller to the amount of men but I, again i think it's it is really down to um, the, the types of crimes that men commit as opposed to women. Yeah, simple I, as that. When I read that stat, I was like, there was no obvious answer. What I do you want? 50 50? Do you want more women? Well, I don't want prison? anyone in jail. I oh, do you? Are you? Is I, that your school of thought? No well, I want should... everyone to be employed and like to have something to like believe in and wake up every day excited about. People don't want to be in jail, obviously. No, I mean, there might be like one or two people that are like, this is a holiday, I'd rather be there. But, but they say that out of bravado. You know, the yeah, reality is yeah. I've been banged up behind the door. Yeah. I know what it's like when that door shuts yeah. on you. And no matter how big and brave and tough you like to yeah. pretend you are in the company of other people, when that door bangs and you're on your own, yeah. um, it's a different ball game. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I don't want anyone in jail. When I watched your show, I was like, how, can I, how could I draw up a plan where these people don't need to be here? Drugs, it, the drug world is the biggest problem. And it's like, okay well how can you and that's my solution you know i'm not saying it's right or wrong or anything like that, but my solution was you know by legalizing it and then you know taxing it properly um i think it would it, it, in my gut it just feels like it would make more sense and add more to the world and do you think you'll act on that then if you're driven by the thought if the thought is now implanted in your your, your thought you mean work-wise yeah, is no, there some way? No, 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 but I mean, would you take the time to now go and make more inquiries about who are the pros, what, what are the pro and cons, and who are the advocates for legalizing drugs? Politicians, people that you could side with and support 
in their efforts using your expertise and knowledge? Is it something you would be driven to do? Well, the, th the thing, like, I don't really talk about politics. I'm like, it's like, um, I, I know what you're saying because I come from, come at it, f I look at it from a different perspective. And um, I do look at things from a different perspective. I don't look at it from a politician's perspective. Like with my companies, like I own them all. So I don't have to report to some other politician and pay, play that game. I can just be like, this is what I think. This is based on my knowledge. If you like it, it's fine. I don't have, have like people around me that I've got a, you know. Answer to. Yeah, and not just answer to, but like be careful what I say. Not that I say anything like dramatic or anything like that, but you know, me talking to you, who's you've gone to all these places and I've watched your shows and this is my thought process after it based on probably because I own companies and I employ people and pay taxes and I see the benefit. And like, so like one of my companies with my friend, John, I, I've not set that company up to make money. I've set that company up because I want him to buy a better house for his kids. Like I've known him since I was 10. Like when he buys a bigger house, right? And his family is like super happy and you know, he feels better about creating a company and all that kind of stuff that will be more rewarding to me than, than making 50 grand out of it next year. Like that will be because I do my other stuff. So when I look at that, that thing there, it's, um, yeah, my motivation is very different. So like my motivation now isn't really money. Um, it, so when I talk to you about stuff like this, it's not cause I want to go out and sell drugs. You know, it's not, not my industry, but there's millions and millions of people out there that are in that industry already going to jail, seeing people get beheaded and it's like why because it's not legal okay if you legalize it what's the benefit we we've just talked about all of them you know so for me it makes it just makes sense you know um and i'm not looking at it because i'm like oh everyone should go out do drugs blah 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 i'm just looking at it logically from an outsider's point of view but even so it doesn't mean that you have to get involved in the politics of something when yeah. you have a business mind and people that you work with have a business mind you're coming at it from a financial perspective on the one hand and a humanitarian perspective on the other so you combine the two and you can't go wrong can you if you're doing it for for for, for the best interest of other people like you have with the mate that you've helped set up in a business surely that is what it should be about. Yeah, politicians, they work in a completely different space and they behave in a completely different way. Yeah. But that's why it's all the more important that people like yourself or businesses, entrepreneurs or people who have companies and have some influence are a part of those, I don't know, committees that can influence politicians, not because they want to get into a political fight or even become political, but because they can see the logical approach yeah. and the difference it will make because by example, they can show how it does alleviate, you know, whatever the situation is, you know, creating yeah. jobs, employment, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, like, the, the, like when you talk about it, um, if I was Boris Johnson, yeah, prime minister, not that that's ever going to happen, but if, and I'm entrepreneur, as they say, risk risk taker, basically unknown. Yeah, I would legalize it. And I would, I would, what I would do is I'd be like, look, you've got six months to prove to everyone that, and if I get this wrong, I get this wrong. Yeah, but this is my theory on it. This is what I want to do. You can all register companies tomorrow, but this is where the tax money is going to go to. And in six months, let's look at where we are based on the consumption that's already going on. And I think it would be a positive thing you know, I don't think that everyone's just going to start doing drugs tomorrow. I don't think that's the case. I think the people that do drugs are just going to do drugs. You know, I wouldn't let bars like allow it. You know, if you know I, social spaces, just do it at home. Do what you want at home. People do it anyway. You know, so I would take that risk. If I was Boris Johnson, I would be like, you know what? If I fuck this up in six months and everyone looks back and I've got this wrong, then fine. You can. That could be my legacy, but. I'm so confident after watching your show and thinking about it, because I started watching your show a little while ago, but really more so recently because I knew you were coming, I would take the risk as a, and maybe that's my entrepreneur side, but I would, I would just take it and I'll be like, 
you know but then again i don't have anyone to answer to right and that is the big thing isn't it he answers to the daily mail or the newspapers who yeah. he needs to convince the public i think that the, the frightening thing is middle england for example as an example would be in uproar to think because they don't have enough knowledge that would be my argument they don't have yeah. the knowledge but you're right someone like boris johnson or other politicians in that position it it would be for them to convince that part of England whose votes they depend on because that's all they care about, yeah. getting into power and staying in power yeah. um, and then fucking everything up when they're doing it, both sides of the coin. Um, but I think it's it's like you say, you have no one to answer to and so you could implement a risk like that. Boris Johnson and other politicians, they have people that they have to appease and that's what they fear more than the right and the wrong of yeah. their decisions you, you, you yeah. know they fuck up all the time they you know covid has been a classic example depending on what side of the fence you sit on john so yeah of course it it it, it, it would be an easier decision um if they passed that but on to someone else i mean i was listening to a, an interview with an ex-copper who spent many many years as an undercover and all he ever did was the drugs trade and he come out, a senior police officer come out and sort of said, you've got to legalize drugs. Now, if people that work in that world, you yeah. know, people who work in drug therapy institutions and all that, all of them are on side of drugs being legalized. Scientifics, I mean, you remember the guy who was a scientific advisor to the, I think it was the Labour government, Tony Blair at one point, Jack Straw, I think it was. Yeah. And he came out publicly and said, you know, drugs should be legalized. Cannabis is, you know, not the threat. And he got sacked because he wasn't towing the line. And that's the, yeah. the, the challenge, you know. And at the end of the day, what does it come down to? If you've got a mortgage or you've got bills yeah. to pay, you know, towing the line and saying what other people want you to say is more important because you have responsibilities. There's, uh, there's so many benefits to it. If, you, if literally every drug dealer in this country registered a company tomorrow, within two years they'll have a mortgage. Do you think so? Well, I think they'd be... I think they'd be priced out, you know. The, uh, maybe, the, maybe, but you know, by you, the Johns of the world, uh, you know, uh, and his uh, mum. Yeah, my <laughs> mum. But, but, oh gosh, she probably. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she, she's but stuffing no, it but, all in the but, toilet right now and about it, to flush it. But imagine, like, in two years, once they've got their accounts together, where you need two years for a business account to get a mortgage, all of a sudden they borrow th four hundred grand, goes back into the economy, more and more money. You know, all this money that is is, is illegal. You know that they, people can't put through the tax system. All that money just gets gets reused and loans and all that kind of stuff it gets put back in the system so we're not just talking about billions in taxes we're talking about trillions in loans right so the economy as, as far as the economy wise it would only benefit but just tax the shit out of it tax 80 percent of it that's still they would still rather not go to jail you know they would just rather would wouldn't well, I, think, I think the other thing is if you look at those countries that have legalized cannabis or other drugs um, and you look at the model that they've implemented and the success um, it, it, it may encourage other countries I do think there are countries that are just not familiar with how it would work and yeah. doesn't work and the kind of financial benefits I'm sure there are not people like you sitting at their table sort of saying this is what you could do this is the benefit because they fear other things and like I say yeah. that is the media it, yeah. uh, it's as simple as that sometimes whereas these countries like canada and the netherlands and i don't know where else but where they have legalized and they are generating a revenue that they can put back into you know doing things in their countries i mean you only have to look at those models seeing that they're successful and it should be enough to encourage other co countries to do the same including our boris yeah yeah it's mad yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, right. We've just legalised drugs. Do <laughs> it, Boris. Honestly, if I was Prime Minister, I'd just do it. Well, you're not Prime Minister, John, no, unfortunately. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be either. Can you imagine? But, but you probably underestimate the power someone like yourself may have in other countries where, um, you, you know, they're not considering it um, because they don't have somebody sitting around their table convincing them that it would be in their interest. You, you, yeah. you, you know, um, I've been to these countries. You've travelled a lot. And, and I just know, sitting down with politicians, how in these other countries, how naive they are. They're corrupt and they're only driven by the finances they can make, um, not necessarily alleviating the problems of their, their country. You'd be yeah. surprised how easy it would be for people to sit down around these tables and convince them that this is something that would be in their country's best interest. I like to think it's as yeah. simple as that, but I do believe deep down it's more complex. You've only got to watch your show. 
for for uh, for anyone that's similar minded to me, I imagine they'd all watch this because because like my, money like that um, in Paraguay where they're all entrepreneurs. I was like, these guys are just students, you know. Obviously, their set of rules is not great. You know, they're making money out of anything they can. They're, they're basically, you, if you're an accountant, you could be an accountant in that, in that place and make tons of money and just help people out with like, you know, monthlies and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and just be like, look, you had a shit month last month. Come on, you need to up your game. Yeah. You could, that's a job in there, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, I look at all these people. I, I watch your show and it's like, it's fascinating for me because, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a you can solve the issue. You can, and if anyone watches your show in the way that I have, um, instead of going, oh, these guys are the worst people ever, it kind of nicely takes me on to your podcast you're doing called Second Chance. Because, like, okay, they, you know, they, do, everyone deserves a second chance. You know, like, there's, I mean, not every single person, but um, all those people in there, I had kind of like, I could could relate to them because I've had no money, like nothing, and. So you go through, when you're trying to make money, really you're surviving. An entrepreneur is someone that's surviving. They take bigger risks, whatever the definition is. I'm not a huge fan of the word, but you know, really you're just trying to make money because you want to survive, right? If you make more money, fine, you waste a bit, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I just, I'm just, I'm, I was just fascinated by the people that are in the prisons. And if anyone watches it, they'll, they'll know that um, none of those people need to be there if the rules are different. The rules, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think, you know, th there are other, and I think I mentioned it before, you know, so, you know, legalizing drugs would be one way of addressing the issue. It would reduce the number of prisoners in prison. That That's one way. But I also think businesses have a responsibility, um, or, or, or at least it, not necessarily financially, but I do think they can partake by, you, you know, building the infrastructure in prisons to deal with them so if yep. you can't legalize drugs the other option would be to create prisons whereby you train prisoners so you 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 take them out of their poverty or take them out of their dependency on drugs by providing them with like i said earlier on the skill set or the trade so that when they do leave prison they themselves won't go back into drugs or get mm. caught up in that world um and you've just got to hope that that conveyor belt works successfully like it does in, in Norway. That is the alternative, you know, while you're trying to battle this corner about legalizing drugs and wiping the problem out overnight, which yeah. is an argument that's been going on for years. There are other ways that entrepreneurs, businesses can invest in um, prisons. Um, uh, although, you know, you know, the argument of having private prisons um, and the need to fill them with prisoners, yeah. which it's is what they do in America and some other countries, including this country, although there is a lot of pushback, yeah. it's not something I favor 100%, but I do see and have seen for myself when when businesses invest in prisons, yeah. um, even a, a small amount, they, they make a difference. It doesn't have to be inside the prison, it might be outside by yeah. offering them an opportunity. And I've worked with lots of companies as yeah. a journalist um, to report on those stuff, scaffolding companies, yeah. painting and decorating companies, you know, haulage companies, or yeah. wh whatever they are, who offer opportunities in very small numbers. They're not wiping the problem out like yeah. you're suggesting by legalizing drugs. Well, I don't want there to be present. So when you say about, um, you know, businesses coming up with ideas to help prisoners, I mean, I don't want prisoners. I don't, I don't want all those people in those like Paraguay and all these places. I, they shouldn't be there. You know, it's like, it's like they 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 have a horrible set of rules that they've been born into, and that's what's happened. You know, it's like yourself when you were younger, you did a bit of petty crime and stuff like that. But that that's a, a environment is a big part of that, right? So if you were to be born, say in the Hamptons in America, mm. you wouldn't have done petty crime, right? So you, and it's because I've travelled. This is how I think. You look at you know, different religions and all this kind of stuff. If I was born in Africa, I, my life would be completely different. It's an environmental thing more than anything. And I look at the prisons that you've been to and they've just got, they're born into a horrible set of rules. It's just like ridiculous. And the government should be looking after them. And if it's drugs that's creating all this crime, legalize it, tax it, create jobs, create an industry, industries around it that benefits communities, th that solves the problem. You don't need prisons. So as much as you think, and um, 
and i think what people do because i know people that do um like um, there's a fitness company i know they they work with um prisoners about getting them their personal uh, training qualifications and i think that's brilliant but me overseeing it um i don't want there to be prisons i don't want anyone in jail i don't want anyone doing crime i'd rather try and figure out ways to create opportunities for them so that they're happy and they don't have to go off and do that and you know so you're dealing with the root cause of the problem yeah what what what, what drives them. but you know like in this country you know i grew up in a council estate in southeast london and the majority of the people that i grew up with didn't go on to become petty criminals or get involved in criminality so you know there is a big argument that your environment and that is the biggest argument in these yeah. countries it's completely different you know where sure. poverty is rife and challenges you know they don't even have proper places to, to to sleep in and i've been in some horrible places in haiti and uh, uh, around democratic republic congo places where you just watch kids growing up and you know it doesn't matter what they do in life they're going to end up being involved in drugs or crime because that's all yeah. they know and all they can see but not everybody does not everybody um you talked about not having any money when you were growing up yeah. look how well you did and there are many people like you maybe they don't own their own businesses but they're successful in their their their, their jobs um yeah. or they hate them they're nine to fives but they do it and they didn't yeah. drive or get driven by drugs or or, yeah. or crime so the, and and, and yeah. when you look at it, the reality is i mean this is the biggest reality that often makes me angry and that is that we have a prison population of between 80 and 90 thousand in this country yeah. um year in year out it has grown over the years to reach the figure it is now yeah. 80 90 thousand but that's just you know a small drop in the ocean in terms of our population we have millions mm -hmm. so why can't they address drug legalization might be one way of dealing with that 80 thousand um it just baffles me that we uh, as a society can't invest in trying to deal with that problem i mean that's a small number of people in fairness you, you know eighty thousand, and the amount of money the billions that are spent on keeping prisoners you know it costs about thirty five thousand a year per prisoner really so you add that up how much does that equate to i mean you know there is an argument give each prisoner thirty five thousand pounds and everybody in this country would be criminal you know but or you give all those prisoners 35 grand and they probably wouldn't do any crime. Yeah, but then everybody would become a criminal so they could get that free 35 grand. I know I would, wouldn't you? You know, so... Well, they're getting that anyway, some people. Well, they are, but that's just containing them. But, but you know, I think it, it, it's not a... You know, you're, it, I don't think you're arguing that we should abolish prisons. I no. don't know if you're an abolishist, but... but no, of course, obviously you're going to need them. But then what I would do is what you're saying is redevelop them into those better places where, you know, it's like, come on, man, you, you know, you fucked up a bit too much this time. Yep. We're going to, you're yep. going to be here for a long time. We're, we're taking away your freedom. That should be enough, you know, and let's do it that way. But just reduce the number. I think for me, it's not UK prison never came into my mind when I was thinking about this. It was right. all these, yep. like I've been South America, I've been Central America and you look at it and you just think man i wish i could do something for these people i mean obviously they're criminals they've done horrific things but you know it's like it's a different set of rules you, it's hard to hard to put yourself in that position you know so for me my position is how do we solve this and how do we solve them these people killing each other um that seems to be my solution obviously it's not a solution not it's not that black and white but um but talking about your podcast actually second chance what what's the um i mean it's pretty obvious what that means um you think so wouldn't you you think it's about but it's 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 i mean my last one i spoke to jj chalmers jj not criminal no. he was blown up in afghanistan lost right. both his arms i met him on a pilgrimage we did a, yeah. a bbc documentary me jj debbie um neil morrissey debbie mcgee ed Byrne, a few celebrities went yeah. on this pilgrimage and it was for a bbc documentary and i met jj and I learned of his story for the first time, where he'd been blown up in Afghanistan. A few of his um, Royal Marine colleagues died. Um, and he just talks powerfully about the second chance that he's been given in life. He survived the bombing where others died. He, he had okay. both his arms blown off, but they were sort of sewn back on. And yeah. although he can't use his arms like you and I can use our arms, um, he's become, uh, a, a, you know, before he became a television presenter, he was a Paralympic yeah. Uh, medalist you know became pals with with prince harry right. who, who set up invictus games and he was one of the british cyclists and, and won medals he's now a television presenter about to appear on strictly come dancing this year so he's carved out a completely 
new career because okay. of the second chance that he was given in yeah. life. You know, before him, okay. I spoke to in one of my earlier podcasts um, a woman who spent 14 years in prison for the murder of her 12 weeks old baby boy. She maintains that she's innocent. She's not been proven innocent. She's yeah. come out of prison and she's finding it very difficult to get on with her life because she still wants a second chance to prove, you know, yeah. that she didn't do what she was accused of, of, of doing. Um, so the, the word second chance, my initial reaction was it's people that have come out of jail um, or, um, you know, but it's it's to do with all sorts of... Um, it's wider. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, and, and the reason I started the podcast is because people often said to me, you've been given a second chance. No, yeah. I fucking haven't. Yeah. I took back my life. I fought. Yeah. I architect. I was the architect of my campaign in prison yeah. to prove my innocence for 12 years. And yeah. it's 12 tough, hard years, John. So when people sort of say you've been given a second chance, they're right. But I don't accept it like that. I fought to get my life back. And then I, I've embraced the opportunities like becoming a journalist yeah. and, um, and working on the stories that I've worked on in all the years that I've been a journalist. Um, I've been very fortunate to choose my own story. So, yeah. You know, getting out of prison, I fought hard to get out of prison. Nobody handed it to me. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to start a podcast where I talk to people from all walks of life who who can explain their own second chance, whatever that means. And yes, it does involve people coming out of prison, mm -hmm. um, getting a job or, or turning their lives around or being given a second chance, having been released from prison. So it you know, incorporates a lot of other, you know, it could be the domestic violence you so, you know the woman who gives or the man who gives their partner a second chance yeah. in, in a relationship and um, why would you do that the psychological benefits so i'm trying to explore what second chance means because you're right when you first hear the word second chance it seems obvious you've done something wrong yeah and you've been given a chance to put it right well sometimes um it could be a businessman like you you make millions of pounds and i don't know if that's what you're worth but you make billions of pounds you yeah. know, you could be an athlete and then you, you put it all up your nose in cocaine and you hit yeah. rock bottom, you're broke, but then you discover another energy inside yourself and you yeah. rebuild your life, um, only you might do things differently. That would be an interesting second chance for yeah. me. Yeah, I think it's exploring it so that people from all walks of life can take inspiration and motivation from the story of others yeah. who have simply turned their lives around through one reason. It might be just surviving a really bad illness yeah. or a bombing yeah, yeah. or a crime. It's a really good idea. Really good. Idea. Well, I'm glad you um, pursued journalism because, well, we wouldn't be sat here and millions of people wouldn't have watched your Netflix series. Um, and it's it's like made a difference to me. It ma It makes me think like, what could I do? Like what, you know, it just, it getting that thought going, like, which is what a lot of videos and series do and all that kind of stuff. But yours in particular, like for me, it's like, man, it's obvious. It feels obvious. Obviously it's not as straightforward. It's never straightforward, but it seems obvious. So thanks for making your show because it's brilliant. Thanks for watching it. <laughs> yeah. Your ambition is, is, is huge. You know, I mean, a, a man like you obviously takes risk and can think big and bad and broad like that. Um, it's just a tough, tough journey, you know, from the individual like Esteban who was scavenging through that rubbish and becoming yeah. a, a mini entrepreneur, you know, put him in a suit, shave his beard off, cut his hair, spray a little bit of aftershave on him and yeah. stand him in front of somebody. Give and him, I, yeah. you, you, you know, it, it, that's all it takes. Sometimes. Give him a better set of rules. Give him a better set of rules and a chance. Yeah. A second chance. Literally, a second chance this has been brilliant this is like I thought it was going to be good but it's been even better than I thought good good well I'm pleased that you invited me on actually <laughs> well I am I mean I don't you know I, I get invited on podcasts and I turn many down I've done only two or three recently um, and, and the conversation is obviously about 12 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit and they want to drill down into that story which I don't mind because I think it's it's who I am. I wouldn't be yeah. the sort of person I am if I didn't have the resilience to survive that. It's what you do after your experience yeah. of being at rock bottom or, or how you move forward that I think is important, how you develop as a person and who you bring along with you, where you can and how you can. Um, because I think there's nothing wrong with selfishness. I think you have to be selfish in certain situations. You have to be able to, and you probably do it on a daily basis, say yes or no when people just want to hear the opposite. Um, but sometimes you have to do that for the good of what it is that you're trying to to pursue um, 
and I, and I, 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 as I said at the beginning of this, you know, I think you take somebody off the street from dealing drugs, give them a pot of jam and tell them to, to sell that in the same way, they could be a successful businessman or woman as opposed to, you know, a threatened drug dealer. Yeah, or you legalise drugs, help them set up a company overnight and then tomorrow they start paying tax to their customers that they're already selling drugs to. Baffling. Thanks for having me on. It's great. Talk Thanks for coming. It's nice man. to meet you. Yeah. No. Um. And I'll 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 be literally watching every other episode that you've ever made. Um. And yeah, I'll message you with my terrible ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So this time <laughs> it's legalized drugs. Next time it's like I, I don't know the sex industry or something. I don't know. I mean, the good thing let's is do drugs first. It's yeah. It's, but you know, I suppose the the, the thing is what. what you know, my takeaway from this is what, what what can John do about it? If you're in a position to do something, talking about it, just being in your position, I don't know, it might be enough. You know, just yeah. having a conversation like we are now triggers somebody out there listening to this or watching this yeah. to have a further conversation. It might be you get a phone call tomorrow, unlikely, but you might get a phone call from Boris Johnson tomorrow saying, yeah. come in, John, let's have a conversation about what you think should or shouldn't be done. Or it might be, you know, in some other circumstances you're spreading the word and i think that's that's what's important and that's all i do as a journalist you know yeah. i don't go in there with an agenda yeah um it does make a difference you know yeah. um people do get employed off the back of of the programs that 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 they watch individuals yeah. that i focus on you know whether it's finlay in mauritius who's just been trying to get a job or this woman i talk about who spent all these years in prison for killing yeah. her kid you know who says she can't get employment somebody's called me up and said, um, we think we might have a job for her. Yeah. So I have the privilege of calling her up. Whether she did or didn't kill her son, I don't know. That's not my judgment. Yeah. She served her time. She's come out. Yeah. And in some people's eyes, she's a monster. Yeah. In other people's eyes, she's an innocent woman. Yeah. But in one person's eye, they felt strong enough, having listened to that podcast, that they would call me and offer her a job. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's going to change her life. Yeah. And ultimately, like I said earlier, I think your show, it's so good and it makes you think so much, especially me when I watched it, that in 20 years from now, that show, there'll be decisions made that will change those people's lives. It's already doing it in, on a smaller scale, but you know, over time it just escalates. And I think in 20 years time, we'll look back at your show and go, we should have seen it earlier. That's good to know. So thanks for making it. Thanks for inviting me in to chat about it. No worries. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming.